Hey students, this is Professor Gore, and uh, this is part three of the New Deal recorded lecture. And so uh, in this part, we're going to be concluding the New Deal, and then in the next topic, we'll get into the causes of World War II uh, and then World War II for the United States itself. So um, two groups, um, you know, women have the right to vote um, from the 19th Amendment of 1920. African-American uh, men already had the right to vote with the 15th Amendment in uh, the 1860s. The New Deal programs weren't specifically designed to directly benefit women and African-Americans, but generally um, it, the programs enhanced their welfare. Um, Molly Dusen, who, who headed the Women's Division of the Democratic National Committee, um, she pushed an issue-oriented program that supported New Deal reforms. Um, so you had the backing of both uh, women and some African Americans as well. Women did, or FDR did employ many women, uh, uh, more women in government than ever before, and had the first female cabinet member. Um, and also, his wife Eleanor was considered one of the most influential uh, and best first ladies in American history. Um, she kind of exemplified this this growing prominence of women in public life. Um, you know, she held press conferences for female journalists um, and also wrote it, uh, kind of wrote her own journalist news column called My Day. Um, she also went about the country quite a bit and um, really pushed her husband, FDR, to, to help disadvantage uh, workers such as coal miners, uh, as well as African-Americans. In fact, she pushed him to pass a federal, <coughs> excuse me, a federal anti-lynching law that unfortunately uh, never was was passed. Uh, the reason why FDR did not push for a federal anti-lynching law, it's not that he didn't favor it, um, but he knew he needed Southern white Democrats votes um, to pass new deal legislation. He thought the new deal legislation would benefit um, African-Americans in general across the South, more so than a federal anti-lynching law um, that only affected uh, a few. And so whether he was right or wrong, um, that was his, his uh, philosophy on it. Um, one of the things too, um, the NRA did set a uh, lower minimum wage for women, um, even performing in the same jobs as men, which is, is not good. Um, also the only 7% of the workers of the civilian works administration were female. Uh, the civilian conservation Corps core was entirely men. Um, the WP, WPA had about 405,000 women on their payroll surprisingly. So the WPA actually hired a lot more women than other new deal programs. Um, when a survey was taken among women in 1936 about whether they should work or not, 82% said no. So you got to you got to figure that survey into um, what the what, what women viewed their role in the workplace was at that time. Um, but with that sentiment, many state legislatures enacted laws that prohibited women from from working. Now, with racial tension that you have, uh, African Americans still remain in the lowest paying jobs, particularly in the South. <clears throat> still face Jim Crow um, discrimination and voting and also social and political discrimination uh, and so forth. Um, you still have the great migration that had taken place during and right after World War I. And many African-Americans moved into, you know, kind of crowded um, segregation, uh, uh, crowded sections of New York. Um, they had to pay high rents to live in crowded, deteriorated buildings. Also, jobs were scarce. Uh, White-owned stores in Harlem would not employ blacks, so you see racism there. Uh, elsewhere in New York City, hard-pressed whites took over the menial jobs traditionally held by blacks as waiters, domestic servants, elevator operators, and garbage collectors. Um, one of the things, too, that you see is that unemployment rates in Harlem rose to about 50 percent, which was twice the national average, uh, which was, was nuts. These conditions triggered a major race riot in March of 1935 as blacks went on a rampage. Before order was restored, four riders were killed and millions of dollars in property were destroyed. Unfortunately, civil rights of blacks would not be protected till later. We'll see that especially happen when we get to Module 3 in the civil rights movement. Um, in fact, uh, many New Deal programs reflected prevailing racial attitudes. CCC camps segregated blacks and whites, okay, which you see the problems there. Many NRA codes did not protect black workers from discrimination, even though that discrimination existed. Um, FDR, uh, as I mentioned, refused to support the federal anti-lynching law. Um, what, what it would have made is if lynching was technically illegal in, at the state level, but it wasn't being enforced. If they had a federal anti-lynching law, if you committed a, a lynching crime, then you could um, be tried in the federal court rather than a, a local court. Um, 
And Mary uh, McLeod Bethune, who founded Bethune-Cookman College, served as a member of the advisory committee of the National Youth Administration, and then as director of the NYA's Division of Negro Affairs. Um, along with NAACP General Secretary Walter White, um, she had access to the White House and pushed continually, though often without success, for New Deal programs that would directly assist African Americans. Here is uh, Ms. Bethune. Um, now, also Native Americans, what is their uh, role going to be like? Um, the New Deal um, had a greater impact on Native Americans than it did some other groups. Um, the Secretary of the Interior and head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs pushed for an Indian section of the Civilian Conservation Corps and earmarked FARA and CWA work relief projects for Indian reservations, which benefited them locally. The Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, uh, sometimes called the Indian New Deal, basically got rid of the Dawes Act that we covered in Module 1, the one that uh, got rid of dissolved tribal entities. It did promote Indian self-government and through formal constitutions and democratically elected tribal councils. So from the Native Americans' perspective, uh, this was a good thing. Uh, government officials no longer attempted to assimilate Native Americans in the mainstream society. Instead, they embraced a policy of cultural pluralism and pledged to preserve Indian languages, arts, and traditions. So Indian Reorganization Act or the Indian New Deal, two thumbs up in American history. All right. Let's look at migrants and minorities uh, in the West. So um, labor union support with the CIO and United Farm Workers included uh, many Hispanics. One of the things that you see at this time, uh, one of the most famous um, um, Americans of the 20th century is a guy named Cesar Chavez, um, who pushed for um, migrant farm workers to unionize with the United Farm Workers and so forth. And uh, we cover him a little bit more when we get to the civil rights movements and, and the, the Latino movement. Um, but Cesar Chavez actually got involved in the 1930s. Um, and so he was able to actually organize a successful union by 1962. Um, Asian Americans, although a small minority, made up sizable populations on the Pacific coast. And some Japanese experienced agricultural success, but around 20% returned to Japan during the Depression. You know why? Lack of jobs. Only 3% of Chinese Americans worked in professional and technical occupations, and discrimination kept them out of many traditional jobs. Okay, so uh, until the rep repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1943, which didn't happen until uh, the middle of World War II, Chinese immigrants were classified as aliens and eligible for citizenship, and therefore excluded from most federal programs. Like I said um, in Module 1, it's one of the most racial, um, racist acts passed by Congress in American history. Um, Filipinos were originally not restricted in coming to the U.S., but the Depression, along with the Tidings McDuffie Act of 1934, cut down their immigration to almost a trickle. One of the reasons why people weren't coming as much to the United States because it was bad economically and it wasn't a good place to try to find work um, and so forth. Now, the Dust Bowl, I used to have my former U.S. History 2 students watch the Dust Bowl documentary from American Experience, but they took it down for free, unfortunately. It's a fascinating story. Um, but between 1930 and 1941, um, farmers in the semi-arid states of Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, Arkansas, and Kansas experienced um, what was called the Dust Bowl. Now, let me explain what you have, kind of a, a perfect storm of conditions to create uh, this, this terrible environmental calamity. Um, you had dry farming techniques that have been done since the 1870s. So after a heavy rain on the Great Plains, um, they would dig down deep into the soil, bring up the um, dry soil and, and compact it on top of the wet soil to keep it from evaporating. But you do that decade after decade, you till up the soil over and over um, to eventually you, you have it uh, pretty pretty fine. Then you have your years of, of uh, periodic droughts. And then what happens with the Great Plains, they have some terrible thunderstorms that develop on there and that these weather systems move down from the Rocky Mountains. And basically what, what thunderstorms did, it created kind of nature's vacuum. And so it, it lifted this dry sand-like topsoil um, from the Great Plains and blew it across the Midwest in fact, it blew as far away as New York City. In fact, there was a French vessel that was coming in to New York Harbor, and they saw this massive dust storm blowing in across uh, the city, and they thought the apocalypse was happening. They turned around and went home. Uh, and so the Dust Bowl was, was horrible. They would uh, People um, began being treated for the, the brown lung, unlike the black lung in coal mining areas. The brown lung was able to keep continually breathing in this, this dust. Uh, there were people who would be trapped in their homes and wouldn't see uh, sunlight for days. Um, they would cut open cows that were dead and, and find their stomachs full of nothing but sand. 
uh, and it, it was it was horrible. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures here in just a minute. Um, but with their crops ruined and their um, you know these farmers had debts that they couldn't pay, at least 350,000 Okies, which were basically people from Oklahoma that left loaded their belongings into their beat up Fords and headed to California. Many were drawn by uh, handbills distributed by commercial farmers that promised good jobs and high wages. Instead, they found low wages and terrible living conditions. Before the depression, white uh, native born workers made up 20% of the migratory farm labor force of 175,000. By the late 1930s, Okies counted for 85% of the workers. Um, it's, it's Some of my high school AP students had to read the book, um, Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. Um, that, that talks about these migrant workers looking for work. There were so many people from the Great Plains states that were coming to California. California had many jobs for them. They, 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 um, uh, California Chamber of Commerce uh, paid to have a billboard um, on Route 66 in Oklahoma that said no jobs available in California. Um, and so it is terrible. So without further ado, let's show some images. Look at that coming your way. I'd be terrified out of my mind. That is a landscape after uh, dust was, was lifted. It looks like a desert. Look at that storm blowing in. So, um, but thankfully, a lot of these Okies found work um, in the defense industries during World War II. Look at that. Oh, that car is ruined. Forget about it. Look at that. That is nuts. Here's John Steinbeck's and the grape of, wrote, the, wrote the Grapes of Wrath. Also wrote of Mice and Men. So these people would pack in. You can see their mattresses in the back of their truck there. The causes of the dust bowl, you have dry farming techniques, you have drought, also wind. The Great Plains is very windy. And then soil erosion. Look at everybody. They've got their entire uh, belongings packed in um, to this car and so forth. Now, with that, with FDR and his Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ikes, being big conservationists, their, their national resources policy stress scientific management of the land and often aggressive use of public authority to preserve or improve the natural environment. So the T TVA um, helped establish um, the Rural Electrification Administration that helped you know, establish a lot of electricity in rural areas. In fact, uh, uh, after World War II, a lot of World War II vets found work uh, for electricity providers um, establishing electricity in some of the most rural areas of states. I interviewed a World War II veteran who did that in Arkansas, uh, worked for an electric company for over 35 years. Um, you had a soil conservation service um, that taught farmers how to uh, prevent soil erosion. Um, also, um, they um, uh, taught them how to till the landscape. And one of the things they did in the Great Plains, they planted a lot of trees. Trees' roots kind of hold soil in place. Um, they also um, had built the Blue Ridge Parkway, which, um, man, at peak times of the year, especially when the, the leaves are turning, it moves at like five miles an hour. It's one of the most crowded roads in the country, but there's a reason why so many people are, are on this road connecting the Smoky Mountains to the Shenandoah National Park. It is gorgeous. Uh, I've been on it uh, as a 11 year old and even as a 11 year old, I appreciated it. So let's look at the New Deal and the arts that uh, happens. So one of the things that uh, FDR um, had with the WPA is the Federal Arts Project. And what it did is it hired artists, actors and writers to work. Um, and so these white collar professions didn't die out. Um, you would think they'd have to go on to something else, um, so particularly blue collar manual labor, but FDR hired them um, for these government sponsored orchestras and um, writing projects, particularly um, a lot of people in their 80s and 90s across the country were interviewed about what life was like in the 1800s, particularly in the Civil War. They interviewed former slaves. That's from the Federal Writers Project. In fact, the Federal Writers Project allowed me uh, the research to do my master's thesis uh, on Arkansas Southern life in the late 1800s um, because the war, World War II happened and, and they didn't, Federal Writers Project didn't publish the war in Arkansas, so it was unpublished, which is why I was able to use it for my master's thesis research. It's pretty, pretty fascinating. Uh, the Federal Theater Project um, produced a lot of great plays, but we'll see that these directors will be targeted in the second Red Scare because some of their plays were sympathetic to communism and they're going to be blacklisted from Hollywood after World War II with the uh, Second Red Scare. Also, a lot of documentaries were done uh, and so forth. And uh, you, have, you have about 25 to 30 million people uh, that were able to view a lot of these uh, plays and so forth. And um, anyway, the, the documentaries were impressive as well. So lastly, what we're going to cover is the legacies of the New Deal. Um, and so... 
you look at a lot of the reform stuff is still around today. Social Security, FDIC, SEC, Federal Housing Administration, and so forth. Um, does the New Deal bring the country out of the Great Depression? No. World War II does that. Um, and so, as I like to say in part one, it's like the country is treading water, but it's not swimming out, out of the lake. Um, so it's not drowning into socialism or economic collapse. It does preserve capitalism and democracy long term, um, but it does not get the country out of the Great Depression. It does, though, unfortunately, lead to uh, the United States dependence on deficit spending. We do that during World War II, which certainly was an emergency situation. Um, and the United States is going to start a trend of printing paper money that leads to inflation that uh, still plagues the United States today. The United States has got pretty bad inflation at the time of me making this lecture. Um, it, it did reform the uh, regulate the stock market and reform the Federal Reserve System and subjected business corporations to federal regulation. Um, but you know, like I said, it doesn't take the country out of the Great Depression. So critics at the time and today will say the New Deal did not go far enough. Um, some will say it went too far. So kind of depends on your political views on, on, on your opinion of the New Deal. But um, um, anyway, it is a big part of our history because it uh, the effects that we see even today.